you go ahead and have a seat and turn to Mark chapter 2. I want to take us through this gospel of Mark and I want you to go through it with me. And I want us to know Jesus. These gospels are such blessings and gifts from heaven. I'm going to start in gospel of Mark chapter 2 verse 15. And uh, I'm going to read and then I'll talk, okay? It came to pass... That as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with publicans and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, I'm going to take you through three separate things of complaints. See, what it is is the growing opposition to Jesus by the religious leaders, by the Pharisees. Now look, the Pharisees, people have a cartoonish view of the Pharisees and it doesn't serve them well. They don't understand the Gospels very well if you, unless you realize that the Pharisees were the closest to Jesus in theology. They believed in the death and the resurrection and angels and heaven and the things that come and they believe in the, Moses gave us the Torah and everything. They were, they were the back to the Bible movement at one time. Now, that by the time of Jesus, they were calcified, like all movements become calcified, right? And Christians themselves have got to watch out or they'll get calcified, right? We could get barnacles too, okay? And the thing is, like, but they were the closest. Jesus did not have a lot of arguments until the week of his death with Sadducees. Why? Because they were gone. They were lost. They were the liberals. They did not believe anything, but they were the powerful ruling elite of the temple, so the Sadducees, and they at one time were right on. You know where they, where they get their name? Zadok. That means the righteous. Jeremiah took a look at a priestly family and said, the family of Zadok's faithful to me. And they were, they'll be priests for a long time. But basically by the time of the New Testament, they were gone. And sellouts too, to the Romans and to the Greek culture. The Pharisees had tried to react against what's called Hellenization. It happened between the two New Testaments. It's a very modern problem. The Jews were supposed to be a separate holy people. They didn't think like anyone else. They didn't do anything like anything else. They were separate and apart to, to, to God. But Hellenization was a cultural movement instituted by Alexander the Great where the Greek culture was supposed to be so awesome, so awe-inspiring, so enlightening, so wise, so sophisticated that Alexander the Great actually tried to impose it on the whole world and it did spread. And the problem is it's just, it's, it's the same problem we have today. It's still spreading, by the way. Humanism, yeah. unbelief, it's like a cancer. I mean, by the time of the mid, uh, between the two testaments, the city of Jerusalem had a gymnasium built, right? Not within walking distance of the temple. A gymnasium is not what you think. It's not like the YMCA. A gymnasium was dedicated to the worship of the male body, and it was a very homosexual thing, and it was a complete decadence, but the Greeks worshiped this stuff, and Jerusalem had one. The high priest of Israel at one point. The high priest is a representative of the whole nation. They all have these sacred names. It was, he, God's in their name, right? He changed his name to Jason, a Greek god. <laughs> How far does it got to go? See, when Jesus came, it was apostasy like they'd never seen before. Now, let me get back to this. So they have a problem. Now, there's three, pro there's three arguments, and then I'm going to look at the, when it kind of opposition just blisters out into the open. But three arguments. Listen, all about eating. Eating and drinking. Because eating is spiritual. Especially who you eat with. Now look, the Pharisees believed in salvation by separation. That the idea, the only way to be saved and forgiven is to get yourself away from everything that's unclean. 
and especially Gentiles and especially sinners and among sinners, especially tax collectors and prostitutes. Now, Jesus Christ came into this world. And one of the things, if you ever really think about it in the gospel, you see over and over again, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is him at table with, with all kinds of people. Prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners, the off-scouring. In fact, the Pharisees wanted to insult him, so they called him the friend of sinners. Is Jesus not the friend of sinners? The more older I get, the more I appreciate the old song. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Now, a lot of people in modern day have taken this to the other ditch. Like, you know, because basically like one hipster church they had the, uh, for Easter Sunday service, they opened with the Highway to Hell. They played by ACDC. Okay, that's taken it the other way. They're, 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 that's so unholy, it's unbelievable, right? But basically... If Jesus sat at meet with publicans and sinners, it's not because those sinners were openly flaunting their sin. When Jesus sat at meet with publicans and sinners, for which he took a lot of heat from the Pharisees for, you could bet that those people were in the process of repentance. They saw something in Jesus Christ. They were drawn to him. No, they weren't perfect. None of us are perfect. But they were in the process of bowing their heart and coming back to God. Remember, rabbinism, which was the expression of the Jewish religion of the first century that was conservative, actually never really did have much of a welcome for sinners. You could not be welcomed into a synagogue or into rabbinism if you're a sinner. Now you could, they did tell you the hoops you could jump through to get your life back and then they would welcome you but not as a sinner. They did not welcome sinners, they despise sinners. What's Jesus do? He eats with sinners. By the way, eating is in, an intimate and spiritual act. Eating is very important and, and uh, so, but what they do, the Pharisees, want to make Jesus, who is the epitome of the righteousness of God, the embodiment of the law of God, they want to make him into a, a criminal. Now, by the way, the same spirit's working in the world today. The criminals are going to sit in judgment on righteous people, on godly people, on Christians, on Honest, hard-working, tax-paying, middle-class people. That's the enemy. To the criminals that run our country now, the ideal citizen is like a sexual deviant of some kind. I mean, that is what the ideal is, or an illegal immigrant or something. And they want to make them criminals. Now, Jesus Christ, they say, what are you doing eating with publicans and sinners? You're defiling yourself. How dare you sit down and eat with them as though they're welcome? And Jesus came back with this. Those that are whole do not need a physician. But those that are sick have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, how many are glad of that? <laughs> so the whole... <laughs> What's, he, what's implied in that? Everything Jesus said is so loaded with deeper meaning, even though it's so few words. I actually begun to believe that's one of the signatures of God, is that it's so few words is so much. Well, what he's saying is basically he's saying to these people, are you whole? Are you saying you're whole? Are you all right? Have you arrived? If you're a Pharisee, your life's goal is to keep everyone of the 613 laws of Moses. They codified it, 613 laws. Now, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And once again, I'm come to call sinners to repentance. What does that mean? I'm calling them to change their mind. To change their mind about what? About God? about where they are, about who they are, about what they've done, about what God can do for them. Now, I find this beautiful. The disciples of John the Pharisees used to fast. Well, here's another accusation about um, food. Remember, 
the whole issue of food is profound and we don't have time to go into it, but how did the human race fall? Okay. A woman uh, gave food to her husband who was standing there that was forbidden and they died. we all died. The whole race went down. What's one of the greatest things God gives us in our worship services to do in restoration to him? Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And one of the beautiful things about the communion is that that is eating with Jesus. A lot of Jesus' ministry. I mean, you, we want him to be giving deep and profound lectures, which he does. Everything he says is profound. We want him to be so spiritual, so far out there. But much of his time, he's sitting at a table with these people, and people are mocking him, ridiculing him, and trying to make him in, uh, into a criminal for eating or for not fasting. Okay. The scribes and Pharisees saw him. Okay, uh, verse 18. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. And they come and say to him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? Okay, the, Fa the Pharisees and the disciples of... By the way, most people that came to John were of the same Pharisaic mindset. They were Pharisees. They were the back to the Bible movement of the day. They could recognize in John the Baptist right on. This man is a prophet of God. It's fantastic, right? And so basically because the Pharisees, they get around to John and then John would point them to Jesus. Now John was an ascetic. He lived out in the wilderness. He ate locusts and wild honey. His disciples were ascetics. They were sellouts. They were like in fasting. Phariseeism had a definition, a threefold definition of action of righteousness. Righteousness to a Pharisee is prayer and fasting and alms. Now remember what Jesus said. Make sure that uh, your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus did not say that was a bad thing. Prayer, fasting, and alms. But he did call on them to get it right in the spirit. Why would you fast to be seen of men? I hope you like the reward because you got your whole reward when they saw you fast. Oh, isn't that great? He's an ascetic. Why would you uh, give alms so loudly that everyone could see it? He says, don't blow a trumpet. Well, he, he, that's a metaphor. He, he knew no one was going to blow a trumpet. What the offering baskets in the temple looked like is trumpets. They were cones, brass cones. So what the Pharisees would do is get, just dump their coins in there. Ch -ch 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 so everyone would see how much they gave. He says, I hope you like that reward. If you give to be seen of men, then you've got your reward. And why would you, uh, why would you uh, give alms and why would you uh, pray on the street corner to be seen of men? You, you got your reward. But then he, he gives us the spiritual and deeper meaning of righteousness. The father who sees in secret that the real actions of righteousness have to do with the condition of the heart. As Peter said, the hidden man of the heart, or um, as Jesus talked about, the secret life. Okay. So these people are watching Jesus. They don't see him fasting. They see him feasting and partying with people they consider to be unworthy of even sitting at a table with. And so they come up to, you know, what is your problem? Why aren't you doing, basically, why aren't you doing righteousness? Now, you wouldn't know if Jesus was fasting, because remember what he said about fasting? When you fast, put on your ointment and redden your cheeks and make everyone not know what you're doing. Why? Because the Father who sees in secret, see, really knowing God, I can't emphasize this enough, is having a secret life before God. Things about you that only God knows, positive or negative, right? Everything God sees in secret. And then he will reward us openly. Now, let me go on, though. They say, why aren't you fasting? And Jesus gives them a great answer, okay? He's always, he's always giving him, okay, he calls himself the son of man. He calls himself the, uh, 
the physician. I'm the healer. And here he calls himself just a startling name. I think it's fantastic. The bridegroom. He's the bridegroom. Can, Jesus said to them, can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is there, is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they can't fast. Do you think the best men in the week of a wedding are going to be fasting? Let's call a fast the night before the wedding. No. <laughs> the groom is there. And they're with him and they share in his joy. God is the ultimate groom. And the believing community is the bride. And we're being prepared for the wedding supper of the Lamb. And Jesus is just announcing here, the bridegroom's here. Now he comes first to Israel, because what is Israel's, one of their names? The daughter of Zion, the wife of Jehovah. She's divorced, but he wants to take her back, like Hosea. So Jesus is like Hosea, he's the bridegroom. Now, as long as I'm here, the friends of the bridegroom can't be expected to fast. But then he makes a prediction, but I will go away. In that day, they will fast. Now, Christians fast. I mean, it happens all over the world. Christians fast. Christians seek the Lord. Christians impose things on themselves. Christians love not the world, right? Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom's with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they can't fast. Why would you fast with the, when the wedding party's all together? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. And then they'll fast in those days. Now, if only Israel would have received her king, then the wedding would have been right there, right? But Jesus is telling us, he knows what the future is. I will be taken away for a while. Then you'll fast. No man sews a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that fit, filled it up takes away from the old, and the rent is made worse. So, so you've got this old garment, and it's wearing out. And that old garment is called Judaism. Now, you don't want to just throw it away because as far as everyone knew, that is the only true religion on earth. And they would have been right that the only true religion on earth is Judaism, of the Judaism of the Bible. Okay, now there are very many innovations and many tears and many uh, wear outs. Like I've got some work jeans that I wear. They're, they're, you can see my leg through them, but I just love them. They fit just right, you know. I don't want to get rid of them, but they're wearing out. Now, what would you think of me if I went and bought a new pair of jeans and cut out a patch out of them to repair my old jeans? <laughs> no. Jesus is saying, you gotta get, you got to throw the old out. We were just talking about that. Because God's preparing something new. Okay. So the old will not uh, be repaired. The new will be better. A wine bottle in the old ancient world was a goat skin. How many would like to drink a drink out of a goat skin? I mean, I, I kind of not, but as long as the fur is on the outside, I'm willing, I guess. But what happened is when you pour the wine into the goat skin and it's continuously fermenting, it shapes the goat skin a certain shape. And then uh, it stays that way eventually. It just quits fermenting and it stays in that shape. Now, when you're done with your bottle, no recycling. Why? Because if you pour new wine into the old bottle, it will start to expand, but only that goat skin's already been expanded, so the new wine will make it burst. New wine's got to be put in new bottles. See, I had a wine skin that I was born and raised in called Catholicism. <laughs> then one day, just like when Moses saw the burning bush, one day, when I was between 18 and 19, a very difficult time in my life, I saw something. And it was Jesus and why he died. Why he died. And I got a new bottle. And I got new wine, which is eternal life.
Now, what if I would have said, I don't need a new bottle. I've got my own bottle. I'm Catholic, like my dad told me. Remember, son, once a Catholic, always a Catholic. <laughs> and I, you know, he, was, he, he meant well. And he didn't die a Catholic. Thank the Lord. He's in heaven, right? But uh, once a Catholic, always a Catholic. Don't walk around in a religious fog. That's what he, that was his advice to me. You're in a fog, son. Thank God my dad would always tell you what he thought, you know. You're just in a fog, wandering around out there. But anyway, what if I would have tried to squeeze the new eternal life in the old wineskin? See, I know people that did that because when I was first saved, there were thousands of charismatic Catholics, people who had met Jesus and were filled with the Holy Spirit, but said, I don't need to leave the church. I can stay right here. We got a prayer group and everything. And now many of them are more Catholic than they ever were before. They see visions of Mary. They prophesy in the name of Mary. They tried to take the new wine and put it in the old wineskin, and they ruined both of them. Anyway, let me go on. These are very important parables, by the way. When people think of parables, they don't often think of these. The parable of the garment, the parable of the wineskin. But these are huge, right? So he says, and it came to pass that as he went through the cornfield. So here comes the third episode where he's going to be accused of eating. Okay. It's, it's like a bad thing to do. Accuse you of eating, right? Um, it came to pass he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day. His disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. Now, this is not Iowa. It's not corn. It's wheat, but they called grain corn, okay? And that, now, they began to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? So right away, the opposition is increasing. First, they tried to get him on eating with the wrong people. Second, they tried to get him on eating instead of fasting. Third, now they're going to try and catch him for eating grain out of the field on the Sabbath day, which they said is harvest. Now, I want to say something about this. Like, the Pharisees are just flat out biblically wrong right here. They're totally biblically wrong. A lot of people think, well, Pharisees, they idolize the Bible. No, the truth is Pharisees innovated a lot. Okay. They did pretend to love the Bible and claim they love the Bible, but their interpretations took them further and further from the Bible every day. So this is one example. Okay. Now, I won't have you turn there, but Deuteronomy 23, verse 24 and 25, the law of Moses, said, when you reap a field... Save the corners. Don't reap them. Because I want strangers or poor people or whoever is down on their fortunes of life. Anytime they want, they can walk through that field. If they're hungry, they can just reach out and grab the corners of the fields. And God says, look, that land's mine. I just gave it to you, but this is what I want you to do. Don't do the corners. Now, what great book of the Bible is all about reaping fields by poor people? Ruth. That's right. Thank you. Well, you would have thought of Ruth, of course. That's your wife's name. All right. Anyway, uh, that's, that's the whole thought. That's, look, that was, that was welfare. That's a legitimate welfare because you had to get out and, and, and pick it and everything like that. You didn't get a check. But, you know, the Lord is a merciful God. Now, he never said anything like, don't do it on Sabbath, though. I mean, you think the Lord, the, you see, part of the Pharisees' problem is they forgot what the law was for. The law, believe it or not, is not a hugely negative thing. In fact, it was fantastic. It was given. And if you want to really summarize what it was really for, is it caused you to love God and to love your fellow man. Seriously, this is what the law really was this was supposed to do you know there's other things it does too it shows you how bad you are and everything like that but man if you if you th you're claiming to be devoted to the law like the pharisees and yet you don't get this that it's about loving god and loving man and that god is so merciful and so good that he wouldn't want a poor person to go hungry and especially on the sabbath day all right now i want to tell you what these people did with sabbath too by the way that uh Six days shall you labor, and on the seventh day you shall rest. It shall be a Sabbath of the Lord your God. For in six days God created the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh he rested, right? That's a very simple command, right? Very, very beautiful. Very simple. 
Very merciful, right? Well, the Pharisees had a series of commentaries and interpreters. The sages. Now, here's, here's part of what, how people get calcified. You start with the Bible, but then you say, well, I don't really understand the Bible very well, and that's true. We all could grow in our knowledge of the Bible. So they get these sages, these teachers, and these teachers have these opinions about Bible verses, and then they write commentaries, and then guess what? Then others come in the next generation, and they write commentaries, not of the Bible, but of the commentaries. What did Rabbi Akiva mean by that? What did Yohanan mean when he said this? What's his ruling on that verse? And then another generation comes, and they have commentaries on the commentaries. And not only that, they create statutes for the laws. You got the law. Uh, you shall no, do no labor on the Sabbath. Well, what does it mean to labor? Okay, what is labor? Like if you pick up a pencil, is that labor? Or if you pick up a pot full of food, is that labor? Or if you pick up a, you, you know, a, if you walk a half a block, is that labor? Now look, by the time of Jesus, you not only had the Sabbath law, but you had 1,500 rabbinic pronouncements about it. Now guess what? You were so glad when the Sabbath was over, because that'd be like the worst day of the week if you really tried to keep it all. And that's a, a perversion of what God's word actually was designed to do. You are slaves. I'm going to give you a day of rest a week where you can meditate on me and seek me. They just inverted the whole thing. And that's what people do. And that's how he does it. Now, when they accuse Jesus of harvesting on the Sabbath, which that's a pretty serious charge, by the way. You know, on the other hand, 150 years earlier when Antiochus Epiphanes it was like the Antichrist took over Israel and Jerusalem and was enforcing anti-Sabbath laws, anti-conversion laws. He was, uh, he was a type of the Antichrist. Jews in the thousands died to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath was sacred. God said that Sabbath will be between me and Israel. They loved it, and they would die for it, right? So when you say, well, he's teaching people to harvest on the Sabbath, that's a serious cause. Now, Jesus could have quoted Deuteronomy 23, 24, and 25, but instead he does something different. He resorts to another Bible story. I won't have you turn there, but 1 Samuel 21. What happened in 1 Samuel 21? Well, in 1 Samuel 21, David and a few of his men are running from their lives from King Saul. Now, there was no temple at that time. The ark was in a tent out in a certain location, and there was no temple, and worship wasn't quite centralized yet. But David on the way out, now, one of the things that they had in the tent where the ark was, was Goliath's sword. So he and his men stopped at this place, picked up Goliath's sword, but they were hungry because they were fleeing for their lives. And so the priests, Abiathar and Ahimelech, the high priest, gave David the sacred bread called the showbread. He took it from before its table at the altar and gave these 12 loaves which it was sacred. It was for priests only. And Jesus said, D you know, remember what happened in 1 Samuel 21? Now, when you read the story, which we went through Samuel about a, week, a year and a half ago, I have, you don't read anywhere in the story where anyone's uncomfortable with giving that sacred bread, which is only for priests, to David and his men. Ahiathar raises no qualms. David has no qualms, and he's a God-fearing man. Nobody's uncomfortable with it. But Abiathar is very concerned about one thing, and that is, David, are your men ritually clean? So he does have scruples. He's not like putting the law of God aside and ignoring it. He does have scruples, but he had no scruples about giving that bread that's only for priests to David and his men. But he did ask them, 
if they're originally clean, if they had, had no relations with women or anything like that, because it's not, it's not that God's against that, but it's that uh, David is on a holy mission. He is a leader of a holy group of soldiers. And here's where Jesus is coming from. Those holy missions and holy soldiers were in a sense considered priests of God because they're carrying out the will of God. That's why the same priestly qualifications apply to the army camp. It had to be sacred ground. It had to be kept clean. It had to be ritually clean because they're out on the Lord's holy war, okay? So Jesus doesn't quote Deuteronomy 23, which would have simply told the Pharisees, you're wrong and your interpretation is wrong. Instead, Jesus brings up 1 Samuel 21, the story of Ahimelech, who was scrupulous about ritual purity, but not scrupulous about giving the holy bread because there was nothing wrong with it under those circumstances. Now, um, <clears throat> In Matthew 12, when Jesus, the same story is told, Matthew includes the detail where Jesus said, why did, uh, why did D D David do that which is not lawful? And then he said, why do priests break the Sabbath on Sabbath day when they work? Okay, he's not saying that David did something unlawful. He's making a point by comparison. That's no more unlawful than priests who get up there and minister on the Sabbath day when everyone else is supposed to rest. There are provisions, okay. Now, why didn't he just quote Deuteronomy 23, and 20, uh, verse 24 and 25, and why did he go through the problem of uh, David and the showbread? Well, because there's a huge analogy there, and I wanna bring this out. You see, if Jesus, is analogized to be David, which he is. He's the son of David. He's the ultimate David, right? Then who are the Pharisees analogized to be? Saul? Or worse, how about Doeg? Remember the story? There was an Edomite who happened to be at the temple, that, uh, that tent, whatever it was, keeping a vow. And he saw David take the holy bread. And what did he do? He told Saul. He slipped out of the camp and reported, hey, David just did something wrong. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? You guys think you're David. No, I'm David. You're Saul or even worse, you're Doeg. Because you're trying to tell me that I'm doing something wrong when you don't even know what you're talking about. See, they got it. They knew. Doeg, it's, the story says, read it on your own, 1 Samuel 21. Great story. Well, all of 1 Samuel is so good. Doeg saw this and went and reported it to Saul because he wanted to get in good with Saul, and he hated King David and destroyed him. He didn't really care about God. He didn't really care about the showbread. You know how we know? Because Saul said, can I find anyone that will just slaughter all those priests? And he couldn't find a Jew that would do it. No one wanted to be guilty of that sin. Doeg says, I'll do it. And he went back and he killed 70 priests. That is not only murder, that's a sacrilege. Doeg cared no more about that showbread than anyone else. You know what, what Jesus is saying? You guys do not really care about the law of God like you pretend to, and you don't really care about whether I work on Sabbath or not. You hate me and you want to destroy me. And it turns out it's predictive because they did. They did. And they eventually would turn him over to another Edomite, King, King Herod. Now, I want to show you one more story here. These are the three stories about food, and I think that it's really interesting. Oh, well, what, first, though, he gives some, some, uh, another truth I want to read, okay? Verse 25, have you ever read what David did when he had need and was hungered, he and they that were with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, 
And he ate showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests. And he gave also to them which were with him. Now, by the way, they knew and he knew that when he said he went to the house of Abiathar, the high priest, the truth is it wasn't Abiathar that was serving then. He would become the next high priest. It was Ahimelech. Now, look, this kind of communication is subtle, but these people had the inside knowledge just like Jesus did. They're talking each other's language. What's he saying? Well, uh, what would happen to the acting high priest? He'd be murdered. Who would he be murdered by? This very one that tried to turn him in and make him out to be a criminal for giving the bread of the showbread. Jesus is saying, that's what's going to happen to me. Same spirit. He's warning them about the spirit they're in. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Now, I love this verse. This is fantastic. Because part of what Jesus came to do is to restore to people the true meaning of the law. God is good. God's never bad. God is awesome. God is generous. God loves. God understands. He gave a Sabbath, and that Sabbath is to give people rest, is to give them a break, is to give them a chance to think about him. But what happens when man gets a hold of the word of God? They completely invert it. And that which was intended for rest becomes, a, in this case, a motive of murder. And then he says another thing that eventually would cost his life. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. To the Son of Man, Daniel's supernatural figure, Daniel 7, given all authority and dominion by the ancient of days. To him is the prerogative of the true interpretation of the Sabbath. Now there's people to this day like, try, want to make us criminals. Seventh-day Adventists who claim to love the Sabbath do the very same thing. Jesus is going to come back and, and punish everyone that worships on Sunday. <laughs> In the name of the Sabbath, they're going to wish our destruction. That's what happens when you listen to false prophets. Okay, it's a serious thing. Now, let me go on to chapter 3, because there's no chapter break there. He entered again into the synagogue. Now, it's still a Sabbath. It's still that same Sabbath. And there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. So they're all waiting, just like they're all waiting out in the grain field. We're going to catch him doing something wrong. We're going to get him. Now, you think he's going to heal on the Sabbath? Now, by the way, the Word of God that Jesus was steeped in, that the Pharisees had been raised in, basically presents wisdom as an either or, okay? Wisdom is life. Folly is death. And then what's Deuteronomy say? You have to choose life or death. You make a choice, okay? So this is a climactic miracle. There's something happens here that's very, very big. Okay, so the, they watch him, whether they're going to heal him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. So that's really what their motive was. He said to the man which had the withered hand, stand up, stand forth. And he said unto him, is it lawful? He said unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil, to save life or to kill it? And what Jesus is doing is calling them to a biblical choice. Are you going to be on the side of death or life? You think those 1,200 extra laws about the Sabbath promoted life? No, God's word is life to those who find it and health to their body. But those 1,200 laws, what do they do? Death. You think that God didn't want poor people to go out into a field of unclean grain and eat? Just because it's the Sabbath? No, nope, you're going to have to tighten your belt and wait till Monday or whatever. No. God's good. And you got to choose life. And this is really a powerful verse, verse 4. Where he stands up in front of his enemies who all claim to know and love God. And asks him, you're going to be on the side of life or death? And they couldn't answer. 
See, this is very similar to like, if your beast falls into a ditch, you guys will go out and get it, even if it's the Sabbath. Don't you think some person is worth more than a, a beast? He says, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil? What do you think? It's, a lot of the law is just common sense. Save life or kill it. But look at verse 4. They held their peace. They couldn't commit. You know why they couldn't commit? Hatred. Envy. Jealousy. It bound their soul. They couldn't commit. I mean, man, wouldn't you want to just raise your hand? You know, you're right, Jesus. Life. I want life. <laughs> no. When he looked around about on them with anger, and he was angry. Why was Jesus angry? Well, it says he was grieved because of the hardness of their heart. Here they're studying the, supposedly studying the law of God all these decades. And they're still here. They don't care. They can't take the side of life. He was grieved for the hardness of their heart and said unto the man, stretch out your hand. I love this story. Stretch it out. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. Now remember in the last miracle, or in the last confrontation, the story of Abimelech, or no, the high priest, Abiathar and Abimelech is re replayed. Only the new players is, see, that's, this is the beautiful thing about Jesus. He recapitulates so much of the Old Testament. It just acts out, right? He doesn't plan this, it just, he just walks in it. Because all of that was prophecy as well as history. In this case, the story of Jeroboam gets replayed. What is the story of Jeroboam? Well, the kingdom of God split into 10 tribes and two tribes because of Solomon's sin. And Jeroboam was the one that was the head of 10 tribes, the biggest part of Israel. And God told him, look, I'll bless you if you follow me. But Jeroboam listened to his political advisors and they said, look, they said, you're going to lose the kingdom that you were just given because Jerusalem, which is part of the other little kingdom, has the temple. So you've got to figure out a way to keep your own people from going down to the temple to worship. Now, how many think that's evil counsel? And Jeroboam figured out a way. He created a new religion. Aaronism. Aaronism. He doesn't call it that, but I call it that. Why? Well, Aaron created a golden calf and got the nation to worship it. Jeroboam's advisors said, no, not one golden calf, two. One at the north and one at the south. And tell the people, this is Jehovah, just like Aaron did. This is Jehovah. You just have an object lesson. Besides that, it'll be a lot more convenient. You don't have to go to Jerusalem anymore. Just go to here, Dan or Bathsheba, and worship God here. Now, this is all in First Kings. And man, man, I love First Kings and Samuel. Oh, gosh. Those stories. So... They set up the altar to the golden calf, and they have a great big festival. And the king himself is involved in the worship because being a king is a very religious position. Okay, he's the son of this golden calf, evidently. And they're all just coming into this religious frenzy. And a prophet emerges out of the crowd from the south and begins to prophesy against the altar. And he cries out and he says, altar, oh altar, the bones of these priests are going to be burnt on you. And you are going to be destroyed. And a king named Josiah is going to be born who will come and kill all these priests and destroy this religion. And he said, here will be the sign that this is going to happen. And instantly the altar split open. Rocks, ashes of the sacrifice and the grease and the blood just pour out of the side of it. And the whole religious festival is stunned. 
And the king goes into a rage. Jeroboam goes into a rage. And he stretches out his hand. And says, seize him. Because he's the king. And he's in power. And he's in charge. You understand? This is 1 Kings 13. Seize him, he says. And his hand withers. <laughs> like that. And this is like one of the most beautiful things about God that I've seen in the whole Old Testament. The king goes from seize him to basically whimpering. Would you pray for my hand? How many know that's quite a change, right? Oh, that many people would have that change from being arrogant, self-confident, in control, in charge, angry. Who's got the right to be angry? He ruined my religious festival. Seize him. And the next thing you know, he's going, would you pray for my hand? Now guess what happened? The prophet prayed for his hand. And the king went, Whoosh, like that. Now we have Jesus recapitulating this story, but with slightly different results. See, Jesus is like the prophet. And the Pharisees are like that wicked king. Proud, unwilling to commit. Anti-Jesus, anti-Christ. Really anti-God, though they didn't know it. And what are they going to do about the withered hand? Jeroboam repented. Now, he did go bad later, but I mean, it's that one beautiful, beautiful point. He went from seize him to oh, please pray for me. And he saw a miracle. Well, they just saw the miracle. What do they do? Verse 6. Well, the Pharisees went out, immediately took counsel with Herod. They went right to an Edomite king to betray their brother against him, how they might destroy him. Now, I've often made this point, and I'm going to say this before I close, that these miracles are all real. They all happen, every one of them. And they still happen because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? But there's all hand-picked. The ones in the Bible are hand-picked. Like it says, Jesus spent all night long praying for every kind of disease, every kind of sickness. Every, but you always see basically pretty similar diseases recorded in the Bible. Why? Because they teach us something about the human condition. And Jesus shows us the willingness of God to reverse these situations. Now, when I think of a hand stretched out, that's what makes us people. We get to do things. We get to choose things. We get to take things. We get to have things. And we get to deny things if we want to. Take it. I always think of Adam and Eve stretching out their hand. And I think that the curse that came on the human race is a kind of a withering of humanity. And remember what God said, too, in the, when he kicked them out of the garden. You've got to get them out of here. Why? They might stretch out their hand in this condition and take hold of the tree of life. Can't have that. I think of Moses' sign. God, Moses said, God, what if my people won't believe me? Well, I'll give you a couple of signs. One of them is very intriguing. It goes with the story. He said, Moses, put your hand in your chest. He put his hand in his chest. He said, bring it out. And he looked at it. It was leprous. He said, put it back in again. He looked at it, and it was whole. And there was a sign in that sign, because what God was saying, Israel, if you'll stay close to my heart, I will make you whole. But if you ever leave me, if you ever forsake me, right, then your hand will be withered. 
And then the last thing I think of, and I'm sure that other people saw this miracle. I mean, they, you'd have to think of it if you knew the Bible. And they did. They knew a lot of the Bible. Psalm 137. The children of Israel are so sinful, they're sent to Babylon. They said, we can't even play our instruments. How can we play the Lord's song in its foreign land? By the rivers of water of Babylon, we lay our harps up and wept. And then he made a wish, a prophetic wish. The Holy Spirit inspired him. If I ever forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand lose its very cunning. Sh shivered, withered hand. See, back to the analogy, I mean, Jesus is everything that Jerusalem was supposed to be. You were supposed to go to Jerusalem to get healed. You're supposed to go to Jerusalem to be pronounced clean. You're supposed to go to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. But everything that Jerusalem was supposed to be and couldn't because of corruption, the Son of Man came into the world and he became the embodiment of it. Very much like when Elijah and Elisha, they were like the temple for people without a temple, basically. Now, and if you remember, the, you know, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand it's cunning lose in Psalm 137. And you know what the next verse says? Basically, remember the Edomites? How they cheered and tried to destroy Jerusalem and said, raise it, raise it to the ground. See, Edom is in this, right? Herod, they went out and talked to Herod and said, Herod, these are not friends by nature. They're enemies. But against Jesus, they become friends. Herod, we've got to stop Jesus. We've got to destroy him. Raise Jerusalem. Raise Jerusalem. So the story of Jesus is a recapitulation of the story of King David and the sacred bread. And as King David's holy warriors, the only thing the priest cared about is, are they ritually clean for the holy war? Because Jewish soldiers, when they're in the will of God, are like priests. And then the story of the withered hand is a recapitulation of the story of Jeroboam. Only <laughs> the Pharisees didn't react like Jeroboam did when Jeroboam saw the power of God. <laughs> Can you heal me? But when the Pharisees saw it, they slipped out and consulted with an Edomite, another Doeg. We've got to destroy Jesus. I guess in the closing, it's like life or death. Choose life or death. He called on them to make the choice. Are you supposed to do good on the Sabbath or evil? Come on, you guys. Which side are you going to be on? Well, they couldn't commit. Well, it turns out a non-commitment is a commitment. That's what a lot of people don't realize. To not commit is to commit. And you will go to death, always to death. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for these sacred accounts and for the power of these stories. Let them mark our hearts. Let them shape our thinking. Let them conform our lives. Let them consume all the sin and disloyalty to you out of our souls, O oh Lord. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.